The first, the first reading this morning is from Psalm 106, verses 1 through 23 and 44 to 48, not the entire psalm. Listen to the word of God. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. And he led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe, and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries, not one of them was left. Then they believed his words, they sang his praise. But they soon forgot his works, they did not wait for his counsel. But they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dothan and covered the company of Abiram. Fire also broke out in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshiped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is also from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 1 through 9. It's found on page 69 in your pew Bibles. And again, let's listen to the word of God. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain." So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Well, imagine, if you will, you're in your car, you're driving down the road, you're minding your own business, obeying all the traffic laws, going the speed limit. And then all of a sudden, a car zooms up behind you and starts riding your bumper, clearly trying to push you down the road, trying to push you to go faster. And you see the driver flash his lights at you, and you hear the driver honk his horn. You even see the driver try to encourage you to go faster with the use of, shall we say, creative hand gestures. And then finally, even though there's a double yellow line down the middle of the road, he takes off, zooms around you, almost clips your bumper as he gets in front of you, and then flies on down the road. How do you react to that? Do you say, oh my gracious, he's in quite a hurry. I hope there's nothing wrong. I hope there's no medical emergency. You know, I should pray for that man. Or, and I have a feeling most of us are going to answer this with choice B, or are we instead provoked to anger? Our face gets red, our hands grip the wheel tightly, our breath starts to come more quickly, and maybe, maybe we start to use some words and some hand gestures that, let's say, we wouldn't be comfortable using in worship. Or how about this? You come home to find a mess in your house, and I mean a mess. You could call the governor and have your house declared a natural disaster area. You've left the babysitter in charge of the kids or the grandkids, as the case may be, but the babysitter fell asleep, and the kids ran riot around the house. There's a broken lamp on the floor. The refrigerator door is wide open, and there's food all over the kitchen. The potting soil has systematically been taken out of the potted plant and has been put on the dog and the cat who have helpfully tracked it now all over the house. And to top it off, somebody, we don't know who, but we have a very strong suspicion, somebody has taken a red magic marker and has drawn on the walls, on the woodwork, on the sofa, and on the other children. Again, what do you do? Do you calmly wake the babysitter and point out things are not the way that you had hoped that they would be? Would you please help me clean up the mess and the kids? By the way, I'm going to calmly tell you that I don't think I'm going to be able to pay you for tonight, and I probably am not going to be able to use you in the future unless and until you can show me that you will be able to not do this in the future, or, and again, I think most of us are going to take option B, are you instead provoked to anger, perhaps loud anger, perhaps at the top of your voice, anger? We human beings are prone to anger, aren't we? And sometimes it doesn't take all that much to provoke us to anger. Sometimes it doesn't take a disaster like this to provoke us to anger. And here's the problem. 
Most of us, when we think of God, we think that God is like us in this respect. We think that God is quick to anger. As author Dane Ortland has written, we tend to think that divine anger is pent up and spring-loaded and ready to gush forth. And we tend to think that divine mercy is slow to build. But actually, it's just the opposite. It's divine mercy that is ready to burst forth at the slightest pinprick. This is a really important thought here. I want to slow down here a little bit, make sure we really ponder how profound this statement is, how often we get this upside down, how often we think God is quick to anger and slow to mercy, when actually it's the exact opposite. He is quick to mercy and slow to anger. I recently read that there are 42 examples of God being provoked to anger in the Old Testament, 42 times that God is provoked to be angry about something. One of them actually shows up in Psalm 106, which we heard a portion of today. 42 different times, God getting angry, being provoked to that, usually because of human sinfulness. But, and here's the incredible thing, never once do we find God being provoked to love or being provoked to mercy? Now, initially, we think, oh, that's a terrible thing. No, that's a good thing because God doesn't need to be provoked to love. God doesn't need to be provoked to mercy. God's nature, God's, God's very being is that He is always ready to love. He is always ready to have mercy. In fact, the Apostle John writes twice in his first letter that God is love. God doesn't need to be provoked to love because He's always ready to love. He's always ready to show mercy. It's His anger that needs to be provoked. Listen to what God tells Moses in our second reading. We read that God descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So here we have God telling us exactly who He is. We have God Himself giving us an insight into His being, into His character, into His identity, His essence. And what He tells us is incredible. And what He tells us is incredibly good news because the first things He says, the first words that God uses to describe His being, to describe His identity, to describe His character, are that He is merciful and gracious. Again, Dane Ortland writes, God does not reveal His glory to us as the Lord, the Lord exacting and precise. Nor does He say the Lord, the Lord tolerant and overlooking. Or even the Lord, the Lord disappointed and frustrated in you. No, His highest priority, His deepest delight, His first reaction, His heart is that He is merciful and gracious. He gently accommodates Himself to our terms rather than overwhelming us with His. Now, that may not be the God that you have heard about. 
that may not be the God that you think that you know. You may be used to preachers and teachers who like to emphasize the wrath of God, right? I know some of you, you grew up with one of those red-faced preachers who pounds the pulpit and rails and yells about how God is angry about this and God is angry about that. And if you don't straighten up, if you don't fly right, you'll feel the brunt of his fury, right? You've heard those kinds of preachers. Sometimes they attract really big crowds. And yeah, God does get angry. And actually, it's a good thing that God gets angry. We wouldn't want a God that doesn't get angry sometimes. If God didn't get angry about sin, if God didn't get angry about abuse, if God didn't get angry about injustice, then that would be a terrible thing, right? That would be a God who is not worthy of our worship. If he looked on all the problems in our world and he was not moved to do something, that would not be a God that we would want in our lives. But notice, notice what it says here about God's anger. It says that God is slow to anger. Unlike us, who so often have our anger just bubbling underneath the surface, right? It's ready to erupt. It doesn't take a lot for that volcanic lava to come flowing out of us. So often we're quickly provoked over little things, over silly things, and we fly off the handle and we mouth off and shoot our, our mouth off at people, and we think that God is like that. No, Scripture says, God is slow to anger. It takes a lot to provoke Him. He can put up with a lot. He is patient, and actually He is quick to love He's slow to anger, and he's quick to love. We're the opposite. We're quick to anger, and the letter to the Hebrews tells us that we need to learn to provoke each other to love. See, in our natural state, we need to be taught, we need to be trained not to get angry all the time, and we need to be taught and trained to provoke one another to love, but our God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and a bounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, that doesn't mean anything goes, of course. We heard in our first reading, our psalm for today, a historical psalm, a litany of Israel's sorry history, <laughs> really some of Israel's greatest failures, and yet how God was gracious in the midst of that, they provoked him to anger over and over again, and yet God continued to be gracious. And yet, over and over, we see God's people, they forget him. They forget who he is. They fail to be grateful for their God and for what he has done. I wish we could have read all of Psalm 106 for effect. It's quite long. There are a lot of failures that are included in this psalm. Hopefully, you'll read it all when you go home. But long story short, over and 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 over again, God's people blow it and provoke Him to wrath. Just consider some of the examples that we are shown here. At the Red Sea, you probably know the story during the Exodus. It says here in the psalm that God's people did not consider His wondrous works. They had just been through the ten plagues. They had just eaten the Passover and seen that final plague, all that God had done to deliver them from their slavery and to lead them out in that first step toward the promised land. But when they got to the Red Sea and they felt themselves trapped, and here comes the Egyptian army, they rebelled, they forgot everything they had learned, and they accused God and accused Moses of bringing them out into the desert just so that they could kill them. That's what they thought of God. God, this is, this is all a big trick, all that you've done, that you just brought us out into the desert so you can kill us. 
And yet God was gracious. He still rescued them, right? He parted the waters of the Red Sea, led them through on dry ground. They didn't even get their feet wet, didn't even get their feet muddy. And then the waters closed over the Egyptian army and the Israelites were saved. It was amazing. Something you would think that they would remember, but they didn't. Because we read then of the story from Numbers chapter 11, where the people get sick of the manna that God provides for them. Now, I want you to think about that. God is literally raining miracle bread down upon them every day. Food they don't have to work for. Miraculous food that just appears every day for them to eat. And what is their reaction? There's not enough variety on the menu. We're so sick and tired of this manna. We want meat to eat. If God really loved us, he'd provide meat for us to eat. And so they rebel and they complain. They have a wanton craving, we're told, for meat. And they demand it of God. And God gives them quail to eat. But then he also sends a plague, a punishment. And we get example after example after example of this, including the most infamous example, the story of the golden calf, where the Israelites actually fashion a new god for themselves in the shape of a cow, which they then proceed to dance around and worship over and over again. And folks, we are the same, right? Over and over again, the people were impatient with God, They were quick to anger. They were quick to forget who God really is. They were quick to fail in their gratitude to Him. But here's the good news. Our God is not like us. He is merciful, and He is gracious, and He is slow to anger. And he is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And yes, while we provoke him to anger sometimes, and while he does bring discipline and punishment upon us, that discipline and that punishment is always for our good. That's always for the purpose of shaping us and molding us into the people that he wants us to be. And more importantly, when we think about God's anger and His justice, and we think about His grace and His mercy, those two parts of His character are in no way equal. God's grace and God's mercy are overwhelmingly bigger than His anger and His justice. He is far more gracious and merciful than He is just and punishing. If you don't believe me, just look at what he says about himself. He says, yes, the sins of the fathers can be felt down to the third and fourth generation. We all understand that. We've seen where mom is abusive or where dad is abusive. That's going to be felt by the kids and the grandkids and very often the great-grandkids too, right? Because that's just how families work. But God says he then shows his love to thousands of generations. Thousands of generations. One author writes, this is God's own way of saying, there is no termination date on my commitment to you. You can't get rid of my grace. You can't outrun my mercy. You can't evade my goodness. My heart is set on you. So there are two things now that we need to do in response to this incredible news. The first is obvious. In light of who God is, in light of the fact that God is merciful and gracious, that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and mercy. We need to worship him, right? We need to praise God. That's why we're here. That's why we come here every week, because every week God is good. 
Every week, God is faithful. Every week, God's heart is set on us. And so every week, we need to praise Him. We need to worship Him. That's why Psalm 106 begins and ends with praise. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And at the end, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let the people say, amen, praise the Lord, right? Amen, praise the Lord. You're slow on the uptake today, my goodness. But you know, I, I, think we need to, I think we need to worship Him every day, right? Because every day He is worthy of worship. And when we do, when we praise Him, when we worship Him, and when we keep on praising Him and keep on worshiping Him, then we do the second thing that is incumbent upon us. We remember who God really is and break through those lies that so many of us believe about Him. We will remember the true character of our God. So many of us forget, and when we forget who God is, and when we forget who we are in relationship with Him, when we forget His mercy and grace, when we forget all that He has done for us in Jesus Christ, it's so easy to slip back into that selfish attitude, that rebellious attitude that is so natural to all of us. But we need to remember our God is good, and therefore, God is worthy of our obedience and our loyalty and our taking up our crosses and following Him. When we instead think of God as that angry God that some of us have been taught to know, when we think that God is some unfair tyrant who is trying to enforce rules we don't understand and we don't like, capricious, arbitrary rules upon us, and when we think that God is up there and He's just waiting, He's just waiting for us to put one toe over the line so He can hurl a thunderbolt down on us, you know, our natural reaction is going to be, forget Him, right? I don't want to live for Him. I don't like Him. I certainly don't love Him. I don't want to serve a God like that because you know what? No matter what I do, I'm not going to make Him happy. So I might as well, if I'm going to fail anyway, I might as well go do what I want, right? That's how so many people live. They think of God as some great big tyrant in the sky trying to enforce some unfair rules that we don't like upon us and that we're ultimately going to fail. That's not who our God is though, right? That's, in fact, the description of a pagan God, not the God of Israel, not the God who loves us, not the God who so loves the world that He gave His one and only Son to live and to die for us. When we remember who God really is, when we remember His true character, when we remember that He is first and foremost merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, then you know what? I am much more likely to turn toward Him in love rather than to turn away from Him in rebellion and sinfulness. And so we need to remember, and we need to worship. And that's why we have communion here so often, right? Because we do this in remembrance. We do this so that we will remember who God is and what God has done for us. We do this to renew our relationship with God, to renew our engagement vows because He is our groom. We are the bride of Christ. We renew our commitment to loving Him and to receiving love from Him. So, folks, let's remember, let's remember each day who our God really is and what He has done for us. He's told us and He's proven to us in Jesus Christ that He is a God worthy of our worship. And then let's give that to Him. Let's praise Him and worship Him and then go forth into the world and live the life that He would have us live. For He is worthy of all we have to give. Indeed, He's merciful and He's gracious. He's slow to anger 
and He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To Him alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we rejoice that You are so good. We rejoice that You are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Help us, Father, to remember these things and help us each day to show our gratitude and our worship and our praise and help us to live lives that are worthy of You. Now be with us as we prepare to come and feast at Your table in Jesus' name. Amen.